mind to mind magazine is um, a guide for spiritual living. This is the religious science monthly publication um, that Kelly's been carrying in her bookstore. I'd like you to read. I'd like to read you an article here uh, written by uh, Reverend Roger Teal, who's from Mount Heights Church um, in Denver, Colorado, which is where I'm from. In an old teaching story, a very wealthy man sought to put some of his many blessings into circulation. He knew of a local carpenter um, who was down on his luck and struggling to support his wife and his five children. So he asked this man to stop by his office and to read about a special project. The wealthy gentleman explained that he wanted the carpenter to build a house that he would probably sell when it was complete. He also explained that he would be out of the country for about six months, checking on his many business interests around the world. So the house would need to be fully built by the time he returned. The carpenter was elated and quickly accepted the job. The two men agreed upon an expense budget for the, for the materials, and the wealthy man wrote a check to cover his costs. Now the wealthy man departed on his travels, and the carpenter began building. However, from the very beginning, the carpenter had a scheme to trim costs and squeeze some hidden profit out of his job. So he cut corners everywhere he could. He used the cheapest, most inferior materials and hired inexperienced laborers and tradesmen. He insisted that they work as quickly as possible since quality didn't matter as much as the savings he could earn through hasty construction. He covered, many, he covered the many mistakes with lots of plaster and paint and finished the house just in time. When the wealthy man returned, the carpenter announced that he finished the job and handed over the keys. The wealthy man then handed the keys right back and explained that he had never really intended to sell the home. Instead, he was having it built as a gift to the carpenter and his family. Congratulations, he said to the carpenter. You and your family get to live in the house you built. We all get to live in the house that we built. It's a powerful story and a powerful lesson in there for each of us as we think about what is our master plan. What are you planning in your life? Are you intentionally building something that is prosperous, that is full, that is rich, that is wealthy? Or are you intentionally building something that is cutting corners and trying to save and, and <coughs> build out of lack and limitation? Our master plan can be for success or it can be for mediocrity. It's up to you in terms of how are you creating your master plan. So in chapter three of Catherine Ponder's book, Dare to Prosper, she talks about the master plan. Now in previous chapters, we've talked about setting our goals. Okay, We've talked about that. Now the goal setting is part of a master plan, but a master plan is that overall plan for where you want to go, what you want to be. It's something that you have to really embellish and think about and work with and create. She says a master plan is critically important. Now sometimes we have done visioning here and we have talked about visioning. A vision is something that shows what the ultimate master plan is going to look like. So that's the vision of what it's going to be when it's all done. And we have that vision and sometimes we can have a vision in two years, five years, ten years. The master plan fills all that in. It's okay in my master plan. This is what I want. How am I, what am I going to do? What am I going to do along the way to develop my master plan? The case of the carpenter, he was cutting, 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 rather than embracing a plan that would be beautiful, wealthy, gorgeous, giving up himself in the process. So when we think about our master plan, it's important for us to understand what it is. It's a path that, that we can follow, and it's one that you forge in your mind that gives you guideposts along the way of where you are going. Master plan is powerful. It's powerful. 
Catherine Connor talks about the master plan of Adolf Hitler. And my Kampf, when he wrote this book, he had a master plan. And he was a very unsuccessful, unknown little twerp of a guy. <laughs> okay. And look at what he became. Granted, it wasn't a master plan for, well, as we think of it, for the good, but it was a master plan that he filled and succeeded with. Now, another one was Winston Churchill at the same time. Winston Churchill had a master plan, and both of them wanted to be in public office. They both had a plan to be in public office, and nothing deterred either one of them. Not their circumstances, not their failures, whatever. When you set a master plan for where you want to go and what you want to do, it becomes a force in which you move through your life. The vision is at the end of the master plan. It shows you your final product, and you can hold that vision. Now, here's an example of a master plan. The story of Wilma Rudolph. She was the 20th of 22 children. <laughs> she was born prematurely, and survival was doubtful. When she was four years old, she contracted double pneumonia and scarlet fever, which left her with a paralyzed left leg. She was told she would never walk again. Now, at age six, <coughs> Wilma had a vision, and she had a plan. At age six, she created a vision of herself. And that was that she was a runner. Okay. In her master plan, the first step, of course, was that she would get to remove this metal brace that she had. And by age nine, she removed the metal brace and began to walk with it. By age 13, she developed a rhythmic walk that doctors had said was virtually impossible. That was a step along the way, but she was not yet running. She had a master plan. Then shortly thereafter, she did start to run, and she entered a race. She came in last, but she finished the race. For three years, she entered every race that she could, and in every race for three years, she came in last. But she had a plan, and she knew where she was going, and she won. And then she won another. And then she started winning every race. And eventually, this little girl, you may have <coughs> remembered her name, she was told that was told she would never walk again, went on to win three Olympic medals. <coughs> that's a master plan. Okay? That's a plan of knowing what you're going to do and the steps along the way, and you never let go. <coughs> you never let go of that. You never let go. The vision is that which is, is within the master plan, and you hold that vision. She could see herself doing that well, and she never let go of it. Too often we have a vision and we let it go. Well, it's not working out very well. Um, and, you know, we, we concede, we give in, we don't hold to it. That is the power, though, of our thoughts and our vision and our plans. You have to hold on to it. Do not settle for less. Do not compromise. Do not settle for less. Do not compromise. Don't give up. So long-term planning is the master plan. And, of course, you can continue to tweak it. Because more often than not, when you have a plan, when you truly have a plan, it will start to happen faster than what you can realize. So sometimes you tweak it. Oh, that's already done. I'm going to move forward on that, move forward on that, and you continue to do so. The goals tend to be more short-term. So you write your goals for the year, okay? And when you write those goals, you put your goals in there, and you do that, and then you have a vision, and now you're pulling together a whole master plan. In essence, with your master plan, you are creating your future, in your mind. And this is what we know, that as you create it in mind, so it shall be in form. That's the unity teaching. Are you practicing what the unity teachings are all about? So, 
Never underestimate the power of a master plan. According to Captain Ponder, it is scientific, it's practical, it works. So you've got to start using it. Now here's an example of how this kind of works when you start to set those visions and set that master plan. Some of you may have heard of cybernetics. <laughs> cybernetics is the science of communication and control in both animals and machines. For animals, and machines too. <laughs> so <clears throat> if cybernetics, what you do is you, let's say you're in an airplane and you <coughs> want to get from point um, A to point B. So you set the program you know, we, we understand this so much more with computers now. We set that program to get us from point A to point B. Knowing where point B is, you get the plane up in the air and it flies. And it's a direct line from here to here. Well, what can impact it? The wind, the turbulence, um, you know, various things that might come along. And we might get distracted and want to go look at something else, whatever. But the whole point is, is that all the nuances of this in cybernetics all get shifted and changed. So if the wind blows it over too much this way, it, it brings it back. Blows it over too much this way, it brings it back. And by the time you get, you know, you, you get to point B. And it's a relatively straight line, even though it might go a little bit back and forth, back and forth, up and down, but it gets you to point B. And it's constantly making those corrections. So here you are, point A. What is your vision? What is your ultimate goal? Your vision is over here at point B. Right? If you don't have one, I guarantee it will be the same old one you've always had, and it will be the same old unconscious patterns that you've lived over and over and over and over again. They probably were lived over and over and over again by your parents and by your ancestors and so on and so forth. So if you don't set up a master plan, if you don't set up a goal, you don't have a vision, it's going to be the same old, same old. Because it's there in your unconscious and it's powerful. So if you believe that you can make a lot of money, let's talk about money, okay? So you're, you're, here you are at point A and you want to be at point B and you say, I want to make $100,000 this year. But if you don't make the plan, and you don't believe it, and you don't do the work, what's going to happen? It's probably going to be the way it always is. And what is the way it always is? Is you're making $25,000. So what happens is that you might say, well, OK, I really, I'm really going to do this. I'm going to set a goal. Have you ever done that? I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to really make it. I'm going to, I'm going to get there. I'm going to do it. And so you start out your year, and you're doing great. And all of a sudden, your sales are going up, and you're doing really good. And you know, thinking, this is great, I'm on my way, and so on and so forth. But you haven't really focused on that vision. You said it once, and you're just letting it go, and you have willpower. I'm going to do it with willpower. But we don't do the inner work. We don't do the master planning. We don't work with our beliefs and our attitudes and all those unconscious things that are working in our lives. And so what happens is it automatically corrects. And so you go forth and you have a great first quarter, and then, oh, boom, down, we got a bad second quarter. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, I think we can come back. And so we go up on the third quarter, and I think we can do it, and boom. Ah, oh, but then the fourth quarter goes down, and where do we end up? Right where we've always ended up at 25,000. Cybernetics. Because the ultimate belief, the ultimate perception, the ultimate plan is embedded in us. And unless you change it, you will, no matter how much willpower you use, you know how many things you do, unless you are working it always, consciously, building that consciousness, changing those beliefs, working with all of that, you will go up, oh, and, then you go, and then you go up, and then you go down, and then you go up, you go down, and you'll end up exactly where you always end up. And you won't grow beyond. So you have to do the work. You have to really plan the things. You have to use the master plan so that you can build and say, wait a minute, I'm going to do this. I'm going to see this in the master plan. I'm going to see this in the master plan. And you build and you do the inner work. That's part of what is so important about the master plan. Now, maybe you're not sure what yours is. So, it's out of the master plan for finding out what your master plan is. 
You can do that, you know, in your prayer, in your meditation. You know, divine spirit working through me, help me build a master plan that is right for me. And let me step out of the way so that I don't think small, that I think big, that I open up to what is really possible in my life. So we have to think big. And sometimes, oh well, wow. no. That's, that's hubris to think big, you know? That's being too greedy, that's being too selfish. So you could come up with all kinds of reasons why it's not okay to think big. But if you step out of the way and say, God, help me define what my master plan is, God will come forth and God always thinks big. God always thinks big. So you turn in within and ask God, what's my vision? To illustrate, a man was talking to God and he said, God, are you there? God, God, yeah. Yes, what is it my son? God answered. Mind if I ask a few questions, the man said? Well, go ahead, my son, anything. Well, God, what is a million years to you? God answered, well, a million years to me is only a second. The man answered, well, God, what is a million dollars to you? And God replied, a million dollars to me is like a penny. Hmm. The man looked at his eyebrows, and so he asked his final question. God, can I have a penny? <laughs> God answered, sure, give me a second. <laughs> of the story is that we oftentimes think so much smaller than what God does and we can think bigger in terms of creating our master plan. So the first thing you have to realize is you've got to be definite. You've got to be definite and at the same time you have to be flexible. So if you know what you want, begin to create that master plan and go, okay and then as things happen, well wait a minute, I want something a little bit different, or I'm learning something more, you begin to shift and change that master plan. It's really important and powerful in your life. When you spend time with it, you are creating it in mind. As you create in mind today, you create your future for tomorrow. To what extent are you creating your future? If you are thinking about your past, your past is creating your future, and you live the same old, same old, same old again, and you do not grow, you do not expand, you don't rise in consciousness, and you don't explore the tremendous spirituality that is within you. You know, sometimes I hear, well, I'm just fine with my life. Everything is really good. I don't need to change. We are constantly changing, and we are constantly asked to grow. We are constantly asked to increase in our consciousness and our spirituality to walk the path that is going to take us to greater joy, greater prosperity, greater love, greater things than we have ever experienced in our lives if we are willing to do so. But it takes some of your time. It takes some of your effort. My whole goal this month with this prosperity and working with Catherine Ponder is every week she gives you these ideas, and I've been talking about them, are you working them? If you aren't working them, you're not going to see any change. It works if you work it. You've heard that, right? Work if you work it. The other thing that she says, be definite, you know, be prepared to be flexible. And then another thing that she says, and this is really interesting, create your master plan and then keep working. Don't talk to others about it. Only talk to those that you know, absolutely know, are going to support you. Because you don't want naysayers in your life. You don't want people saying, well, that's ridiculous. You know, how old are you? <laughs> what are you thinking about doing? Do you really think? I mean, isn't it in your genetics? <laughs> you know, that this is going to happen and that kind of happen? I mean, you know, it's. Michael Beckwith has this great saying, you know, to stick the statistics. You know, no matter what is happening, no matter what may seemingly not be there for you or be possible, it is. 
if you hold on to that master plan. So don't share it with anybody. Just let it go. It can be powerful. It can be so powerful. And so many things can happen that you have never <coughs> seen in your life. So I want you to be thinking about this week <coughs> to really work with your master plan. Really put it together. Create it. Now, when we all the way through, we've had all these kinds of assignments. Are you working these assignments? Are you doing it? If you want prosperity in your life, Catherine Ponder and all of the others in Unity have said that these principles work. Begin to really work with them. And you will find amazing things happening in your life. So what is your master plan? To be able to ask any of you next week. <laughs> or maybe not. You might say, I'm keeping quiet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so blessings. I just really invite you to work with it and do it because it is powerful. Uh, that's all. Thank you.